Hi everyone, my name is Rohini and I'm hosting the first webinar in our series of educational webinars with Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. Thanks so much for watching this video and I'm joined by the lovely Sarah Bentley who's the founder and director of Made in Hackney and she's going to tell us all about this incredible organisation. But first, definitely sign up for our mailing list so you can join more of our webinars in the coming weeks. We're doing them every fortnight and um, you can also join us as a member and be part of our incredible community. We are a community interest group that aims to promote the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet to the health, to health professionals and the public alike. I hope everyone watching this is safe and well during this quite challenging time. And if you have any questions or would like to find out more about our work, definitely log on to plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com. But now I'm going to take it over to Sarah to tell us a little bit more about Maiden Hackney and the delicious dishes she's going to be showing us how to make today. Hi everyone, and uh, nice to see you, Rahimi, in our new digital world where we only see each other on Zoom and not in the physical. <laughs> um, so my name is Sarah Bentley, everyone. I'm the founder of Made in Hackney. We're a plant-based community cookery school, and we've been working in the community for seven years now as a charity, helping people to eat affordable, accessible, plant-based food. We're all about getting people to aim for seven to ten a day, so go beyond the five a day, and really help people to thrive by making um, healthy food choices. So that's what I, I do for a living. I'll let you into a little secret though. I'm not an amazing chef. I have loads of teachers who are amazing chefs. I like to call myself a professional eater and a professional <laughs> email sender. So um, you're going to be learning with me tonight, but I have been vegan for 20 years. Um, I've had a baby and breastfed a child vegan, and so I do feel, as much as I like to joke about my cooking skills, I do feel like I have a good two decades of knowledge up my sleeve. So hopefully I can share something with you all tonight. So I think when people are starting to think about eating a vegan diet, you can get really swept up in fancy recipes and fancy ingredients, and actually you can just do some really simple things to make sure your diet is packed with nutrition. So I'm just going to show you some really simple stuff tonight. Nothing jazzy, nothing fancy, nothing that a chef would need to do. This is just everyday cooking skills that we can all do. Um, so I'm going to show you four different dishes. One of them is a nutrient boosted tomato sauce for a pasta. Um, the way we're boosting it is we're going to be adding some additional vegetables and also some lentils to that sauce. Amazing. I'm going to be showing, does that sound good? That sounds great. No, we're all about the lentils and the beans and all the legumes and I think um, what I love about Maiden Hackney is that you make the most of sort of the pantry staples and all of the whole plant foods that are available rather than, obviously we all like having, you know, some, sometimes having some of the kind of um, like you said, the jazzy vegan foods that are available in store, but they can be really expensive. And this video is all about helping people to eat plant-based on a budget, using what they have, because a lot of us just, we can't access all that much fresh food right now that easily, especially if we're trying to use social distance as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And even the recipes I'm doing tonight are really flexible. Um, you can swap things in and out, you can use different things. And I'm going to be doing really rough measurements as well, just to, you know, empower people that we don't have to weigh everything out by the gram for the type of cooking I'm showing you tonight. This is what I do at home, fish, bosh, bash, while, you know, getting ready, the kids ready for the next day. So rather, don't get too hung up on sort of professional chef -y skills, just make gorgeous food that's quick and easy. So the first one is nutrient booster tomato sauce. The second dish we'll be doing is a cheesy tasting sauce, which we're going to make from butternut squash and chickpeas with a little bit of nooch. This is our nooch. I'll be talking more about it later. This is nutritional is, yeast. Uh, nutritional yeast, is that? Nutritional um, yeast. Yes. <laughs> nutritional yeast. So the lingo is nooch. That's the that's the slang name. Um, it is a bit of a specialist ingredient, but it is the only one we will be using tonight. 
Um, you can buy it online. You can buy it now in all supermarkets. You couldn't a few years ago. So out of everything we're cooking with tonight, which is very sort of core pantry ingredients, this is the one thing that's slightly special to this. I would recommend you get the one in the blue packaging because it has additional B12 added to it. This one doesn't because they've ran out of that in the shop I bought it from. But the one you, I would recommend is the blue one that said vegan on it with additional B12. It's a bright blue packet. So the next dish we will be making is a nutrient sprinkle. So not really a dish, just a nifty little thing that you can carry around in a jar with you and you can add it to meals when you're in cafes, you can add it to your meals at home. And it's just a really great way of boosting the nutritional profile in what you're eating. And then the final thing, we're just gonna do some um, lightly sauteed greens and we're gonna add some lemon to that because when you're eating greens, if you want to maximize the iron absorption, it's really smart to have it with some vitamin C. So that might be lemon or red pepper. But I'll let Rahini talk about that because I don't have any nutrition qualifications. So if you want to add some more about that, that would be great. Yeah, I think it's great to pair an um, iron rich sort of, sort of plant those sources of iron such as um, legumes or dark leafy greens those are all good sources of, of, of non-heme iron you want to pair that with a good vitamin c source so broccoli would be paired with red peppers for example or as you said sort of like there's a reason why in indian cooking we always have a big squeeze of lemon with our dal there's there's a science there, so this has been done for years and um, but it's a good one to remember and definitely for nutritional yeast and um, while the one that's fortified with b12 can definitely give you a little boost remember that if you are on a plant-based diet you do need to take a b12 supplement and that amount is slightly higher if you're above the age of 65 it's about a thousand micrograms a day Day, whereas for everyone else and um, it's a slightly different amount so definitely have a look at that if you are starting a plant-based diet and anyone really should be supplementing the b12 i think it's estimated that up to 40 percent of the population is deficient so um yeah it's a very important one for all of us okay so we're going to get cracking with the nutrient boosted tomato sauce and the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to add some cherry tomatoes and some red peppers to a baking tray. We're not actually going to add any oil to this. And um, obviously some chefs would very lightly brush the vegetables with oil, but we're not going to do that tonight. And um, if you're making it for one, just a small handful is fine. I'm actually going to use loads because I'm planning on taking this home for my family to have over the next few days. So I would roughly say a handful per person, but you know, it's not an exact science. So I'm just going to whack all these cherry tomatoes on the baking tray and I'm using two sweet peppers which I've sliced in half and I've already de-seeded them from the middle. So I have done a little bit of prep, a little bit of blue pea through, mainly because I have terrible knife skills and I don't want you all to laugh at me. So I did that, I did that off camera. Um, so I'm just going to whack all these in the oven. I'm going to roast them on about 180 and um, it could be 200 just keep an eye on them you don't want to sort of burn them too much and they're going to go in for about 20 minutes something like that but i'm just going to keep an eye on them because i've preheated my oven and at made in hackney we have quite a vicious oven so it can be a bit more efficient than your average recipe so i'm just going to whack these in the oven now so everyone can see and i'm just putting them in together just a slow roast, no oil, no seasoning. Now, if you're making a traditional tomato-based sauce, I'm sure an Italian chef might bulk at my red pepper being added. So the red pepper really is a nutrient-boosting um, addition rather than it being a traditional Italian sauce recipe. So I'm just going to whack that on. That's great. We want to add in more vegetables where possible and, you know, maximise our opportunities to eat as many vegetables as possible. I'm completely with you on that. And um, yeah, I, I enjoy even with dal and things like that. And, you know, lentils are obviously a great cancer staple. I enjoy adding in tomatoes and other vegetables into that. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the 
tomato sauce ready for our roasted vegetables in 20 minutes time. So you'll see that I really am just whacking stuff in the blender. So I've got some pre-cooked yellow split peas here. You could also use instead red lentils. You could use chickpeas. Um, I think red lentils are the best because they maintain the color of the sauce, but I didn't have any, so I'm just using yellow. And um, I would go for a cup's worth because you don't want them to dominate the flavor of the sauce. But you do still want to get that nutrient hit from including them. So I did just over a cup, I didn't quite feel that, but that's, that's how much I'm using in here. So I'm going to add that there. Then I'm going to add some passata. Now you could use a tin of chopped tomatoes, you could use a tin of plum tomatoes. I'm going with passata because it's what they had upstairs. And as you can see, I'm doing it all by eye. I'm just going to pour it in until I'm about halfway up the jug. And I'm making a batch so that I can take it home to my family. Yeah, I do definitely recommend batch cooking, especially at this time. We don't want to be sort of in the kitchen constantly, especially if you are a key worker or you're working still, you know, long hours. You want to just have, you know, big hearty meals. You can put them in the fridge or the freezer and then have quick, healthy meals whenever you need them. Absolutely. Um, adding to this, this is not essential, but it will make it taste really tangy and rich. I'm adding some tomato paste. This comes from the Turkish supermarket and you get a massive amount for a very cheap price. Um, and I also like the fact that it's in a can so you can recycle it more easily than a tube, which ends up in landfill. I've used two massive heat taste tablespoons, as you can see there. I might go in for a bit more. And then this is a bit of a luxury ingredient to add. I'm adding in a splash of apple cider vinegar. That will give it a really nice tang. You could just squeeze, if I could actually open it, you could just squeeze. I might get another one out there. Come on. No, here we go. You could just squeeze some lemon into it. Um, but I'm a big fan of apple cider vinegar, a really big fan. So I'm just going to put in about half a tablespoon. I do all my cooking by eye, so when I have to suddenly do measurements, I'm revealed. I'm going to, no, I'm going to do a bit more, so that would have been one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. Now, it's entirely up to you, chef's choice. You might want to put in a pinch of sea salt, you might want to omit that. If you're not having added salt in any other part of your diet, you're not eating ready meals, you're not eating pre-made sauces, etc., a tiny pinch of sea salt in homemade sauce is going to be fine. You really have to watch the salt if you're buying a lot of ready meals, eating a lot of crisps, and there's massive amounts of hidden salt in the food you eat, and so you're not quite aware of how much you're consuming. And um, that doesn't apply to me and my family, so I'm just going to do a tiny little pinch of sea salt there. You could also, if you wanted to, you could add a teaspoon of Marmite. Again, that's rich in B12 and it gives it that salty taste. So I'm just going to put a tiny little bit in, totally not essential. It's just a way of boosting the nutrition in it. And it has that umami taste that I think a lot of people, when they're switching over to eating more of a plant-based diet, they sometimes miss that savoury umami taste. And I think Marmite, miso, all of these kinds of things. Nutritional yeast is another good example that really, um, you know, does give that unique flavour to meals. But of course, if you're avoiding salt for a health condition or otherwise, and one of our tips is if you are going to use any salt at all, to add it at the table, so just use a salt grinder and then you then you get a little salty hit without using the quantity of salt when you're adding it to cooking. So that's one option. You can use kombu flakes, you can use um, a lot of herbs and spices to and um, things like lemon juice or apple cider vinegar and that decreases your need for added salt. So definitely with salads and things like that you should be putting lots of lemon vinegars and um, those sorts of things, seaweed flakes and you will find that you don't need much salt at all or none at all. So this jug now I'm going to put to the side because we're waiting for the cherry tomatoes and the peppers to roast. You could put them in raw, 
but when you roast them, it really creates a really delicious sweet taste. And um, without actually adding any sugar, so by roasting them, you're getting that sweet taste without adding any sugar. So we're just going to wait for those to be ready. So I'm going to put that aside. So while we wait for those to be ready, uh, the next thing I think I'm going to show you will be our cheesy sauce. Now, juggling all these bits of equipment. Let me just get that Vitamix going. And what I'd love to know from you, Sarah, is um, what are, so I know that you really focus at Maiden Hackney on eating locally and seasonally, you know, as much as possible. What are the benefits of that? Because we have lots of members and people watching this who might already be on a plant-based diet. What are the benefits of eating locally and, locally and seasonally? And is it possible for all of us to do? I think it's not possible for everyone to do. It very much depends on what food you have available locally. In Hackney, we have a fantastic veg box scheme called Growing Communities, who sell local, seasonal, organic food at a reasonably affordable price. They also take healthy start vouchers and they do discounts for pensioners. So they really strive to be the most accessible way of getting local, seasonal, organic food. Now, obviously, lots of people don't have that. And when you go into a supermarket, it's a minefield. You're like, oh, I don't, I want to avoid plastic, so I'll go that. Oh, but that's not in season. Oh, that's not organic. So unless you're part of a veg box scheme, it's actually really difficult to achieve local organic seasonal. So don't beat yourself up too much about it. But do look to see if there is a local veg box scheme in your area because they will make all those decisions for you and deliver something either to your door or you go and pick it up that meets all of those credentials. Um, it's better for your health because vegetables and fruit are traveling long distances, losing their nutrients, being treated with wax, and also better for the planet because it's a lower carbon travel footprint. Okay, so these are my butternut squash. As you can see, they've already been roasted. So I put them in the oven on 200 for about half an hour. You can really try and struggle to cut a butternut squash. So forget that, just cut it in half and whack it in the oven in its skin. And then you can just scoop the flesh out yourself with a spoon rather than trying to cut it into lots of little pieces. So I'm just going to spoon all the flesh out right now into the magic mix. Now, we're quite blessed at Made in Hackney. We've been given these magic mixes for free. Don't for any minute think we need to spend the amount of money it costs to buy a magic mix. You can just get any sort of cheap blender. Um, even a stick blender just to begin with is absolutely fine. And you can get them in Argos for 12 pounds. So don't be intimidated by our magic mixes and things like that. We've been given them <laughs> to have in our charity. And what, can we use the skin as well? Of the, if, it, if the butternut squash is organic, could you put it in with the, the skin to retain the fibre or does that ruin the sauce? You can, but it could make the sauce a bit bitty. I haven't experimented using the sauce. Uh, I mean, not the sauce, sorry, the skin in, um, in this. But maybe next time I, I will. So I'm just scooping the flesh out. And can you see how, we, how easy? I'm just being careful to not burn my hands because it's still quite hot. But compared to skidding around with a big sharp knife, trying to cut this into tiny pieces, it's really quite simple. And then before we started this webinar, I also soaked some nuts. Now again, to make this cheesy sauce, you don't need to use nuts. The butternut squash alone with the chickpeas that I'm going to add soon with the nutritional yeast will do the job. But again, to increase the nutritional profile, I wanted to add nuts. And also they give it a really lovely creamy taste. Definitely. So if you are on a very low fat whole foods plant based diet and you are avoiding nuts for a specific health reason, then you could just avoid the nuts. But if not, then obviously are really nutritious and um, definitely that is, are you using cashews by any chance? I'm using some cashews 
And I didn't have many in the storeroom, so I just added some almonds because we had them. Um, but normally I would just use cashews with this. But wait not a lot long. So I soaked these nuts for about an hour. And um, ideally you should soak nuts overnight. So if you know you're going to cook them with them the next day, just leave them in some filtered water overnight in a bowl. I didn't have time to do that, so I just added boiling water to them about an hour ago. And that really softens them up. And also, I believe, and Rahimi will tell us more about this, doesn't it release phyto-anti-nutrients? Doesn't it release anti-nutrients? It is just the amount of phyto, so it makes it a little bit easier to digest. So if you have trouble with your digestion, um, then I recommend definitely not soaking nuts and seeds, but also soaking um, grains is really important. So particularly things like um, rice and things like that, um, you can soak them, it decreases the cooking time. You shouldn't soak them for too long because obviously you don't want to, um, you know, food poisoning. So I think about eight hours and especially really important for beans because um, it not only decreases cooking time, but again, um, those, those, the, number, the phytate quantity in it decreases so it makes those nutrients a bit more bioavailable and easier to digest. So if you have trouble with gas or bloating from eating beans, then soak your beans, sprout your um, beans and legumes and things like that. Soaking and sprouting are my two best tips. Cool. So I'm going to add some chickpeas now to this. These were in a tin. Now make sure you capture the juice that the chickpeas are sitting in in the tin because the juice is actually aquafaba which is a delightful word that basically means bean water and you can <laughs> use it as a, it basically just means bean water and um, you can use it as an uh, animal product free egg replacer so the actual bean juice you would store it in the fridge or put it in a you know tupperware in the fridge and then when you want to make waffles or pancakes or cakes or an omelette a vegan omelette you would whip the aquafaba either with a hand whisk or an electric whisk until it goes foamy and then you would add that into your you know your batters and it does make the most amazing egg with paper um, so i've done that i put it in the fridge and now i'm just adding some chickpeas i'm going to add about half a tin now the critical bit the cheesy bit totally exposing how i cook i'm just shake i'm just going to shake it in I'll measure it though, just, just so people, I think it's going to be half a cup, it's going to be half a cup. And nutritional yeast has so many micronutrients in it and it's a really good source of protein as well. I think like about two tablespoons has about four grams of protein. So it just adds in a little protein boost, um, iron and, and those other micronutrients. So I like sprinkling it a lot. Recipe. Do you know how it's made? How does this weird flaky yellow stuff? actually get made. It looks a bit like fish food, but it is an active yeast. Some people get a bit worried by the name nutritional yeast, but it's dry and inactive. Um, and um, yeah, it does. I think sometimes the sound of it or the, the look of it sometimes freaks people out, but it does have the most delicious taste and it's definitely a good vegan staple out there. And also the chickpeas. I mean, chickpeas are the cheapest source of protein in terms of bang for your buck. You get a lot of good quality protein when you um, when you choose chickpeas, I think there's about 14 grams of protein per cup of chickpeas, so that's very, very good indeed, considering we only need about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram in our body, so that's about, for someone who's 55 kilograms, that's about 44 grams of protein in a day, you can easily meet your protein needs on a whole foods plant-based diet, and um, yeah, that's not a concern as long as you're eating a good variety of food and you're getting enough calories. In. Okay, so what did I just do then when Rahini was talking? I added um, a capful, I think I added two capfuls, of apple cider vinegar to this. Again, completely not essential. I just really enjoy the tang that apple cider vinegar gives my food. You don't need to use that if you don't have it. Um, I also added a bit of water to loosen. That's because when this mix is blending, you know, you want it to move around your food processor. And if you don't just add either a bit of water or a bit of plant milk to loosen, sometimes that can be, it, it gets, it's too thick. 
Okay, so I'm just going to do a little taste test. Um, obviously, no double dipping in a community cooking class. It's only me here, so it's okay. See, I think that's delicious. Um, do you, someone might want to add a bit more, a splash more apple cider vinegar. You could add a splash of oat milk. You could put it in a more high powerful blender. And then the tiny little flecks I can see in here, which is the almond skin, you'd get rid of that. I'm really not bothered, you know, it's going to be delicious and I'm not going for a gourmet finish. So I'm, I'm fine with it as it is. So we'll put that aside. And if someone doesn't have butternut squash, I've made the same sort of recipe by adding um, potatoes and carrots, and those last for ages in the fridge. So, um, or in the larder rather, you should shouldn't store potatoes in the fridge. And um, that you can you know keep them for a couple of weeks at least. So if you are practicing social distancing and you're limiting your trips to the grocery store, then definitely potatoes and carrots and other root vegetables are a really good idea. Squashes also like butternut squash does last for ages as well. Um, and any other vegetables that you recommend keeping in the pantry, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, root vegetables last for ages. So, you know, sweet potatoes, butternut squash. I'm afraid we do have to embrace British root vegetables, turnips, weeds. You do get used to them after a while. And cauliflower lasts a long while as well. So does purple sprouting broccoli, um, cabbage. You know, you've really just got to embrace British produce because um, it's what we need to be eating. You know, when thinking about the global food system, we need to really fall back in love with what we can grow here locally. So you just saw me add a tiny pinch of salt to the water for cooking the pasta. And I'm using some brown rice pasta. It's gluten free. If you don't have a problem with gluten, just use normal pasta. But I just find if I eat too much, I feel very bloated. Plus, I like the idea of all these new jazzy pastas made of legumes and lentils and rice. I just think it's kind of exciting and, you know, just widens your culinary palate. But by all means, just use standard pasta. Yeah, you could use whole wheat pasta, spelt pasta. There's lots of legume-based pastas now, like edamame bean pasta, red lentil pasta, and they have higher fiber and protein content. So that's quite a good idea. They do taste a bit different to regular pasta, so they have a slightly chewier texture and can be a little bit pricier. But, um, you know, if, if you're about to try something new, I think it's nice to get whatever you can get your hands on, because at the moment it's not that easy to find a lot of pasta in the supermarket, I've found. Um, so you've got to kind of, yeah, try some new stuff if you, if you can find one of those legume pastas, for sure. Uh, they, so, so if you go into a health food shop, legume pastas can be shockingly expensive, especially mm. if you get really fancy ones like edamame beans. But all of the major supermarkets are now starting to stock their own brand of red lentil pasta or brown rice pasta. So increasingly we are seeing them at a more affordable price, which is really cool. So I'm going to take out our roasted tomatoes and red pepper. You could keep it in there a bit longer but um, I'm going to take them out now, they're looking fine. I don't know if you can see that. And they're just starting to brown on the top. That's when you know they've got really sweet. And we know that cooking increases the bioavailability of lycopene, which is a very powerful antioxidant that's found in um, things like tomatoes. So definitely there are benefits to cooking as well. Whilst we want to include plenty of raw foods in our diet, there are some benefits to cooking and lycopene and um, bioavailability in tomatoes is a good example of that. Um, and yeah, I think cans of tomatoes, they're very cheap, very affordable. Just make sure that you look out for no SOS and no salt, oil and sugar. Just go for ones that are just tomatoes. I find that really interesting how some produce is really best to be eaten raw for a nutritional profile and others cooked. And others, you have certain benefits when raw and certain benefits when cooked, like spinach, I believe. There's two different, you get one thing more if it's raw and one thing more if it's cooked. It's fascinating, yeah. really. 
It, no, it definitely is. And I think that's why it's like, it's good to have a nice varied diet if you can and kind of have like a mixture of different raw and cooked foods in your diet, especially because we live in England where we're not going to get, um, you know, as much kind of tropical fruit. We don't really have the climate to eat just a purely diet. I think it's nice to have a mixture of different things. I did a demo with someone the other week and um, she'd forgotten something and she just walked off backstage. It was most disconcerting. <laughs> Right, so the only reason why I'm using another blending device is just to save me washing up while we're live. You don't need a, a different blending device or, than what you did the bottom up squash with. Sarah, would you mind telling us a bit more about the NHS programme that you had with Major Company and a bit more how you work with the community? Because I know you work with people from all different backgrounds and some people, many people who are plant based already. So how do you broach that kind of topic of healthy eating and how do you make it fun and exciting for people? Sure. And um, so we've been around for seven years now. I must say when we first started our programme, um, our local NHS provider, as wonderful as they were, were a bit suspicious and a bit not, not particularly happy about recommending a cooking school with a vegan food policy. They were very friendly, um, but I could see that was a concern for them seven years ago. But over the last three years in particular, more of their dietitians, more of their staff have actually you know gone vegan or flexitarian or vegetarian there's a lot more information out there and so now we have a really wonderful relationship with the nhs and um, all our local health workers and we have referrals from social prescribing officers from gps we have referrals from um, community dietitians the, the diabetes department we've been doing some classes for a group of um, diabetics who are on a, it's like a low calorie intervention program run by the NHS. And they came to us to learn how to cook healthy plant-based meals. I'm not a big fan of focusing on calories. I think it's a little bit 1980s, but you know, what we taught them was useful regardless. Um, so we're really happy with how we work with the NHS now. Um, I think there's just been a behavior change and um, a mood shift where there's more acceptance and more knowledge about the benefits of a plant-based diet and so we're really seeing that in terms of the practitioners who are confident to refer people to come to our cooking classes yeah it's really fantastic we were so happy when that started happening so That's happy amazing. And how can people support your organisation? Because obviously right now is a really challenging time. I'd love you to tell us a bit more about the um, meals that you're providing to the most vulnerable people in the community and what else people can do who are passionate about um, supporting organisations like Maven Hackney. So, obviously, this is not how our kitchen normally looks. It's normally packed with people. It's just Billy No Maid for me cooking for you right now. But um, so we've, we've had to completely change our service. No cookery classes, no supper clubs, no community celebration. Everything we did was about face to face interaction. So, a couple of weeks ago, when we really grasped what the impact of the COVID 19 crisis would be, we decided we would convert our service into a direct-to-door free emergency meal service for people who need it most in Hackney. So we started off with the humble ambition of launching in about three weeks time, maybe 50 meals a day. And in reality, we launched 10 days after we had the idea, we've been making 300 meals a day. And now from Thursday, we'll be making 420 meals a day. And these get delivered by cycle courier direct to the door with the non-contact delivery service of people that otherwise would struggle to access healthy food. It's completely free. We've done a crowdfunding campaign to fund this service. Um, we need another sort of 10, 15 grand to secure the service for three months. We've got enough for two months right now, but we really need to keep fundraising because two weeks ago we thought two months would be plenty of time. 
And now it's very obvious people are going to be locked inside their homes, but at, you know, especially the very medically vulnerable, for at least three months. So the, the um, goalpost keeps shifting of how long we need to be running this service. Um, so any help spreading the message about our campaign, about our fundraising campaign, would be hugely appreciated because, like I said, we're about £15,000 off being able to deliver it for three months. And really upsettingly, we're already at capacity. We've got 420 referrals from all sorts of groups, community groups, elderly associations. And just in the last two days, we've had 80 new referrals that we cannot service. Oh, no, no, I think it's so important that if people have, you know, they can spare some cash that they would otherwise be spending on their food or on their morning coffee, then definitely donate to Maiden Hackney via the crowdfunder. But if you don't, if you're not able to donate financially, then you can definitely help spread the message via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Even if you have just five friends on, you know, one of those platforms, it's going to help spread the message and reach and um, help these people that really desperately need these kind of um, this kind of support at this time and what about um you know in terms of people who want to join the cookery classes but aren't joining as part of the community once you're back on your feet can they is there another way that they can kind of um be part of made in hackney or attend one of the classes absolutely so in in normal operations we run all our free community classes uh, we also run community classes which anyone can attend one-off ones and we also run master classes which they are pricier, but they're in things like sourdough bread and raw food, vegan Korean, you know, they're quite jabby and exciting themes. Um, and every ticket that we sell for that, the money goes straight back into us providing our free programs. So you can still buy a voucher for these masterclasses now, and you can dream ahead about the time when we can stand next to each other again and cook in a group setting. So, yeah, if you'd like to buy someone a voucher for a present or for yourself, that's available on our website as well. Um, let me show you the greens now. So I've got this beautiful selection. Um, they were called stir fry greens and they came in my veg bag. And it's a bit of kale and you can see the top here, the flowers. So, you know, that's really nutritious. You wouldn't see that in a supermarket um, packet of vegetables, getting to see the flowers. And um, there's some Chinese cabbage in there. There's some purple kale and there's one small baby leek. So this was all in a mix. Bag. You can just use kale or you can use collard greens, but it's really important if you're eating a more plant based diet every day if possible to have a good portion of greens. Now, this is for folate and iron. Uh, while I chop them up, Rahini can tell you more about that rather than me pretend to be a nutritionist. No, definitely. I think you want to include as many, many dark leafy greens as possible. So, um, particularly, you know, the low oxalate variety is especially good for getting good plant-based calcium. So things like kale is a good low oxalate green, where the calcium is more absorbable than something like spinach, which is high oxalate. So um, kale, bok choy, and um, Brussels sprouts, those are all good examples. But really, whatever greens are in season, in season and available to you, like Swiss chard, all of those, are it's really important to include as much of that in your diet as possible, you know, several times a day if possible, but really all vegetables, the dark leafy greens are so rich in iron and calcium and so many other micronutrients. And um, so really important to include those in your diet. And obviously, um, you can eat some raw as well, like things like rocket and things like that can be added to salads. And um, if you can't really find dark leafy greens that easily at the moment or you're not able to make it to the supermarket that regularly and you don't have a bed box then you know definitely try and stock your freezer with things like frozen kale and spinach and peas and things like that because and um, yeah it's not as ideal but it's still a good source of nutrients that's looking really lovely and um yeah i could see like a very i've just ribboned the vegetables what that means is you grab them all together in a bunch and it's narrow slices as you can manage you just shred them with your knife and that's called ribboning it's not difficult you just need to keep them compacted together while you're slicing and um, i'm going to add them to a frying pan i'm not going to use any oil um, obviously some people might likely saute them in olive oil i'm actually just going to use a tiny bit of water 
and I'm going to use it how you would oil, basically, um, and they're going to sweat, sweat down and cook really nicely. Uh, once they've got, got going, let me just check my heat's on, yeah, the heat's coming, I will put the lid on them to make sure that they're not too firm. I mean, I really enjoy quite crunchy veg. My mum calls it um, junior veg. She says, I want senior veg. I want senior veg. None of this. <laughs> but I, I like very firm vegetables. But my mum sadly is not with me tonight, so I will cook them quite firm. So they're just, the pan's just starting to heat up with the tiny splash of water that's in there. I'm just going to let them do their thing for a few minutes and then I'll be putting the lid on. In the meantime, I am going just to make sure you can see everything I've done. And to get the maximum amount of juice out of your lemon, it's really important that you give it a roll. You can just use the base of your hand. Now don't tickle it. You really press down. You're really sort of giving it some firm pressure and rolling it back and forth side to side. You get so much more juice out of a lemon when you do this than if you just cut it and squeeze really hard with your hand. So I'm just doing that now. Lemons and limes last quite long in the pantry as well. I think I keep, I keep mine in the fridge for a couple of weeks. So um, obviously the vitamin C content will slightly decrease during that time. But, and then they're best eaten fresh, just like all vitamin C rich foods but and again it's a good option particularly during quarantine or when you're practicing social distancing and um, i pre-cut some garlic so i just took the skin off and cut it into small squares i'm going to add that to the pan now and um, i'd love to hear why you think it's important to get some bit of garlic into our diet especially for our immune system yeah, definitely. I mean, what we know can help support the immune system is having a healthy, you know, and a plant based diet. And it's not going to obviously prevent you from getting something like coronavirus, but it does help to bolster our defenses and support our overall health. And um, garlic is another great anti inflammatory ingredient, just like ginger and garlic and all of these. And they're also prebiotic rich. So they provide the right environment for your gut microbiome and um, with garlic you want to crush it and leave it exposed to the air for about 10 minutes before and there's a reason for this it's to do with um, and kind of activating the allicin the enzyme i'm gonna go wash it while you're telling them that i'm gonna go wash it <laughs> So yeah, definitely crush the garlic and leave it for about 10 minutes. Chilies and garlic and ginger and all of those things. And they also add so much flavour to cooking and to food. So um, really important to add that in, especially when you're trying to reduce salt and sugar and oil. You want to include as many herbs and spices and ingredients like garlic and ginger and chilli as much as possible. And um, chilies are also high in vitamin C as well. So um, yeah, they're also really good to include. Um, so I've got my lid on the greens now. I don't know if you can see that too well, but I've just put the lid on so that that's capturing the steam and it's going to steam the greens quite nicely. I just need to keep an eye on them to make sure that I don't burn them or take them past a point where they won't be as nutrient rich. Um, earlier on when we were talking, you saw me take the pasta off the pan. I just drained it and that's now behind me. Wonderful. So the yeah. thing, uh, Sorry, I was just about to say gluten-free pastas tend to cook in slightly less time than regular wheat pastas, so definitely make sure they don't get too squidgy. But um, a lot of the gluten-free pastas in supermarkets are unfortunately made with quite refined flour. So if you are not, if you don't have any kind of celiac disease or non-celiac related gluten sensitivity, then definitely get the whole wheat pasta. But um, you can also use whole grains, intact whole grains are even better for you. So things like barley, quinoa, brown rice, black rice, red rice, um, farro, teff. There are so many different whole grains out there. And the more intact in terms of, um, you know, the grain, then the better. You're getting all the different micronutrients, the B vitamins, the folate, the, all the fibre and the protein is all there in that husk. So um, yeah, include as many whole grains as possible in your diet. And they're also really cheap and affordable for the most part. Okay, so now we're going to make the nutrient sprinkle. Now, this was a genius idea of one of my fellow vegan mamas. 
Um, so just to sort of bump up the nutritional profile of our children's food, is when you go to a cafe, often the kids, if they don't have a very evolved palate and they're vegan, you end up with tomato pasta quite a lot of the time. So she would carry around in a little jar her nutrient sprinkle. I think she called it magic dust or something like that because, you know, you put it on your kid's food, you go, bit of magic dust, bit of fairy dust. Now, there's no um, set recipe for this. So the one I'm going to do tonight, I'm sure Rahini will give us some gorgeous information about why it's so good for us. So I've got a little tray here of the things I'm going to use. So on this tray, I've got a cup full of pumpkin seeds, which are loaded with zinc and other incredible things that Rahini will tell us about. I've got a cup of whole hemp seeds, so they're not in the shell. This is quite a sort of a more of a specialist product, but again, they do start to sell them in supermarkets now. This is not essential, but I do like to add it. Sunflower seeds here, again, they're out the shell. If you're shopping in a Turkish supermarket or um, an international supermarket, quite often the sunflower seeds come in a shell, but these are not in the shell. At the back here, I have some pre-ground flax seeds. So flax seeds, if you buy them whole, they're also called linseeds, they're cheaper than if you buy them ground. So I bought whole linseeds and I've ground them already and I'm just keeping them in this jar. So this is ground linseeds. Got some great amigas in there and also in the hemp. Rahini will give you more details about that. And then finally, we've got our nutritional yeast again. And so I'm going to combine all of these together to make basically a dust. And I would carry that around with me in a jar and you could sprinkle it on salads, on pastas, basically on anything. So while I load up my uh, blender, shall we hear a little bit about why you think that's such a good dust? Yeah, I think that that um, magic dust is like loaded with healthy plant-based fats and it's definitely important to have good quality fats in our diet. And, um, you know, a plant, it's, it's really, really important. And um, definitely I would sprinkle a little bit on to the green so that we can absorb some of those fat-soluble vitamins. I think vitamins A, D, E and K are all fat-soluble and there are also other micronutrients that will be and that's all you need. We want to include some of that as much as possible. And um, but yeah, pumpkin seeds are really rich in zinc. Men still need slightly more zinc than women. I think it's eleven um, milligrams of zinc form for adult men, and it's about eight for women. And um, so um, yeah, it's important to have a good source of zinc, especially as that plays a quite an important role in our immune system. And sunflower seeds are high in vitamin E, which is another um, very good antioxidant. So again, loaded with the healthy fats. But hemp seeds, like chia seeds and black seeds, are rich in omega-3, alpha and linoleic acid. You need slightly more hemp seeds in terms of the ratio than you do chia or black seeds. So you need um, at least sort of about a quarter of a cup, if not more, to get your daily omega-3. Um, but you can include a couple of sources of these to get your daily requirement of omega-3, which is really important for your brain health and for various other things. I think it's a great idea to buy the black seed whole Sarah because by the time it's already milled in the store, um, it may have already been prone to rancidity because those the seeds are quite delicate and they're quite prone to oxidation. Um, I'm just going to mute you for a second while the is on. Yeah, I've muted you now. Um, but yeah, really good idea to have uh, black seed, chia seeds, hemp seeds, um, at least one of those a day, or six walnut halves, that's the other alternative, to get enough alpha linoleic acid. And you can also take a supplement to get enough um, DHA, which is the type that people often think you need to eat fish for that, but it's actually algae derived. So you can also take that if you like, but um, definitely a good source of ALA is something that I really recommend. Um, you can get hemp seeds in bulk from sort of online supermarkets or 
in, in health food stores and they last for ages. All of these things, are, including the magic dust, should be refrigerated or kept in the freezer because we know that once, and um, especially nuts and seeds are very prone to oxidation. So I store all my nuts and seeds and flax in the freezer or fridge. And that prolongs really? I don't do that. Interesting. So I should be keeping all my nuts and seeds in the fridge. Yes. So one of the downsides to keeping it in the fridge or freezer is that sometimes if it's something's not right in front of you, you might not remember to eat it. But as long as you're yeah. quite diligent and you put food, then that really helps preserve the nutritional quality. And they can last for about six months in the freezer. And they sorry, six months in the fridge and up to a year in the freezer. Um, but it's important to do that. So particularly if you bulk buy things like nuts or seeds, so if you're buying a huge quantity of that, then you want to store them in the freezer for sure. Um, but otherwise, I pour mine in the fridge and then I just take out what I need. So it's especially important to flat these. So I, if, you're, if you have the time, you can um, mill it in a coffee grinder. And um, but if you don't have the time, what I do is I just mill it once every two weeks, store a batch in the fridge or freezer, and then I enjoy it. Um, but that's the way that I recommend. It's also a lot cheaper as well. Um, that magic dust definitely should be stored in the fridge. Definitely. So if you want to take a small portion out with you in a jar, do that when you're out and about, and then put it in the fridge when you get home. Well, definitely, if you're feeding children on a plant-based diet, you want to include enough healthy fats. Children do need um, you know, more calories in, in, in terms of they, they've got small appetites. So things like nuts and seeds and stuff are important. For adults, depending on you know your particular health needs, we recommend sort of like an ounce a day or probably around a handful of 30 grams. That would sort of the amount that I go for. And again, it's much better if you have the whole nuts, like the any of these kinds of nuts or seeds that's much more beneficial than having just um sort of like almond butter or things like that although they are obviously delicious and you can definitely use them as well so i was just putting my hand under the lemon um as i squeezed it because you're just doing that to catch the seeds when they when you squeeze that's all that's doing it's nothing very jazzy um i took the greens off the heat so i'm putting the lemon onto them after they've you know stopped cooking and, and then that's it really, I'm going to assemble the meal. Now the things that I've shown you today, um, you know, you don't have to do all of these for a meal. It could just be the nutrient boosted tomato, tomato sauce, pasta with some greens. You might be using a sprinkle on something else. These are all just some sort of staple recipe tricks that I think are really good to have up your sleeve. Um, but I'm going to portion, I'm going to portion a little bit out. <laughs> But I think it's, Sarah, I think it's incredible because you've just, you know, you've naturally got so many different things in that meal that I'd recommend it's very well balanced in terms of the nutrients. You've got the legumes in there. I think it's important, you know, when you are transitioning to a plant-based diet to include legumes as much as possible because they're not something that we find that, you know, easily in the British diet. It is a transition for us. So um, including chickpeas with tomato sauce or eating dal or adding things like split red lentils to a stew or soup, these just add boost that nutritional quality quality of the meal and they're also so cheap affordable such good sources of protein and fiber and zinc and all of those other nutrients so legumes are really really important and we're not getting enough only one in ten UK adults currently meets their the requirement for fiber which is about 30 grams and on a plant-based diet on a whole foods plant-based diet you can easily get double that if you're eating you know a large variety of fruits and vegetables so and um, yeah we really need to i think fiber is a real issue in the country in this country unfortunately as you can see i eat loads of food so i have a massive plate do you excuse me i'm sorry if you're portion watching and having to um be very conscious of your portion i ride a bike and i run around after a five-year-old i seem to need an awful lot of food the sprinkle on at the end you could put it on the green you could put it on the tomato sauce what's great about the tomato sauce is it just looks like red sauce so i always get my kid to eat that because he doesn't like complicated food sadly he likes single ingredient food he loves Buddha bowls everything's separate and not messed with so the tomato sauce is a great one because you snuck some lentils in there you snuck some red pepper in there he does like tomatoes but you know you can blend so much up 
mm. and you essentially just look like red sauce. No, that's a great tip, especially if you've got, you know, young children or children who aren't that sure, especially if you're new to a plant-based diet and you want to introduce some of these foods to them. But I'd love to see, Sarah, could you show us a close-up of the, the dip? Because we can't see that clearly on there, but yeah. Oh yeah, I can see that. that looks amazing. Looks really delicious. So, you know, it's not chefy, it's not, you know, gourmet plating, but I'm very confident it will taste delicious. It will sustain me and it will make me feel really vibrant, energetic and well. And I'm not a trained nutritionist. I just, you know, have a few years under my belt of eating like this. And I just know this will more than cover my bases. I'm going to try it. You can give us a taste test. <laughs> I feel really bad for eating you're not here to have some. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, and it's definitely past, past my dinner time. It's almost 10. So thank you for doing the webinar so late and, and teaching us all of this after you've had such a busy day. I've loved it. Oh my God, it's really delicious, actually. So good. No, I think what you said about portion size is really important. Something I always bang on about, you know, nonstop is that when you transition to eating more plant, you need to increase your portion size. Lots of us do that. And we think that, you know, we can just stick to the same small portions as when we're eating, it, say, an omnivore diet. But plant-based foods are naturally less calorie dense and we need to fill up. You don't be scared of carbohydrates. Don't be frightened to increase your portion size because you need to feel full. You need to feel satiated. And, and if you're eating all of this kind of food, it's not calorie dense. It's full of nutrients. So like I, I totally agree with what you said, rather than counting calories or focusing on things like that, we need to focus on the nutrients and, um, you know, just feed, feeding feeding our soul, feeding our bodies with like this amazing food. And right now is not a time to be worried about um, all of that. We need to just, whatever we can find in the supermarkets, we need to make healthy, delicious plant-based meals with that as much as possible. And thank you for showing us how to do it with just pantry staples. Absolute pleasure. Sorry, I'm really getting into the eating. No, I have a couple more questions for you, Sarah, if you don't mind me asking, because I know you do an amazing class at Maiden Hackney, Feeding Your Family for a Fiver. And what would you say to people if they say, you know, I'd love to be more plant-based, it's really expensive. How can we show people um, that this is an affordable way to live? So the class is feed four for three pounds, so less than a fiver. So less than a fiver. Um, utilize ingredients that are either the supermarket value brand or just supermarket own brand. And basically it's the kind of thing I've made now, but without the nutritional yeast and without doing the nutrient sprinkle, you could basically make this for four for under three pounds. And um, not doing the free pasta, so just a few tweaks. And you've totally got this. Totally got this. Uh, just the nutritional yeast would bump up the price. So would the apple cider vinegar. And so would the nutrient sprinkle. If you take those away, you still actually have a very nutrient packed meal with the red lentils, with the chickpeas, with the veg, with the greens. You know, a lot of bases are covered. And what are the kinds of meals that you recommend to people who are trying to feed their family on a plant-based diet and they're new to it? What would, what would be some go-to meals for breakfast, lunch and dinner that you'd recommend? So, I mean, okay, well, if we start for breakfast, porridge is just a great one to get the whole family into because you can really um, go a bit wild with the toppings. You can get the kids involved. You can have a little station where they add raisins or seeds or bananas. Kids really like um, to have a bit of jurisdiction and that's when they tend to eat different foods. If you leave food out for them to add and try themselves, they're more likely to try it than if you just whack it all on their plate and say, eat this. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue with this is when you start doing that with young kids, really young kids, a lot can end up on the floor because they're exploring and they're playing. If you're on a super low budget, this is heartbreaking and really stressful, really stressful. So I completely appreciate how having the luxury to do baby led weaning, where you, where you put food in front of kids and they just rub it on their face and fling it on the floor and all of that is wonderful and instills incredible food habits in your children later on. I do understand that actually when you're on a very low budget, watching that food hit the deck 
oh, it's just heartbreaking. But generally giving children some choice. So even if they're older now, they're like six or seven, if you put a little bowl of raisins, maybe a little bowl, a sliced banana, but if you have one banana, if you offer that to the family, it doesn't look like much. You slice it and fill a bowl with it. Suddenly that banana looks like a serving that can stretch around everyone. And then if children can just add what they like to it. And you know, sometimes I'll put a tiny bit of cocoa powder in a bowl and I'll say to my boy, you can put a pinch of that on your porridge. And he's like, oh, I've got chocolate. And you know, it's just a tiny pinch without any of the unhealthy fats, without any of the sugar, but it will kind of still make your porridge go delicious and chocolatey. So porridge for me is a family staple. We couldn't do without porridge. And um, sometimes at the weekend we have savory breakfast. So, you know, roasted cherry tomatoes, you know, some greens, some toast, etc. Lunch, I, this tomato pasta dish is an absolute staple in my house. Just hiding things that I don't think my child has eaten much of recently. I'll just whack them in that, even in really small amounts. Also, I find um, doing a smoothie for a child quite satisfying. Like my kid's gone off spinach, but if you give him a banana mango spinach homemade smoothie, he will drink that all day long. If you're lucky enough to live by a market, you can get five or six mangoes for two pounds. If you're buying them in a shop, it could be two pounds per mango. So what you have accessible to you in terms of your shopping really can dictate what you're able to give your family. Um, pizza, homemade pizza is often a revelation in our classes because it feels like making the dough is difficult or something that chefs do. Whenever we teach people how to make pizzas in our classes, they're always like, I can't believe that's it. I can't believe that's it. And again, the children have the jurisdiction to put the toppings on themselves. And when they've done that, they're way more likely to eat their own creation. Yes, sometimes it might mean they have dough tomato and a whole carpet of sweet corn, and that's it. <laughs> but it's a start. It's a start. And I think giving them a bit of control over what they eat rather than fighting means a few days down the line, you're in a better position to go, do you know what? Why don't you try just putting that olive on? If you put it in the middle, you can make a face. Look, let's make a face with the olives. But rather than, you know, it's like a, a suggestion. So you need to start by giving them some control. And then when they're really comfortable, just start slipping in the sort of brainwashing about, can you try this? Why don't you try that? How about adding that? Or just leaving it near them to add. So yeah, pizza is always a massive hit for us. Another one that's a big hit is um, our sweetened sour noodles. So we make that with tofu, tomato sauce, pineapple, green pepper, and either rice or noodles. And again, that's always a massive hit because people feel like they're having takeaway food. Um, fried rice is another big hit with kids because again, it can taste quite sweet without putting any sugar in. So you would use peas, sweet corn, finely cubed carrots, and some pineapple, put it with some brown rice, and then just very lightly toss it, very lightly fry it. You don't really, you're not really frying it, you're just giving it that quick once over. And kids seem to love that. And again, you can bump up the nutritional profile if you've got the funds by using some silken tofu, and you can roll that in a bit of turmeric, swirl that round the pan while you're frying, and it looks like egg fried rice. So again, the, the fried <laughs> rice is, is a winner. For, for families because it, it you know it's quite it's quite sweet but also you can see the separate things they're not combined you can see peas you can see carrots you can see sweet corn and children like to often understand their food and if it's all muddled up quite a lot of kids will just go mm -mm, no sorry so things like sushi as much as that sounds really glamorous so many kids like sushi because it's clear there is the seaweed, there is the rice, there is the filling. And we've had so many families go, I can't believe my kids are eating sushi. I can't, like, their mouths are hitting the floor. And I think it's because there's clarity to sushi. You really know, you can see exactly what you're getting. It's really fun to make, they can roll it themselves. And you can use a sushi mat, they're not that expensive. Or you can roll without a sushi mat, you can totally 
roll without one. Yes, seaweed sheets are a bit more expensive, but we definitely have lots of families who wouldn't have imagined they'd be making that at home now saying, we make sushi once a week now. So yeah, anything that's sort of fun, interactive, has a bit of jurisdiction and choice, I think is a really good winner for families. That's amazing. So just the one, I'm just going to leave you to enjoy your amazing meal, but I want to just ask one last thing, which is um, if people aren't based in London and we've got, you know, members all over the country watching this, um, how can they help in their community? Or even if they're in London, how can we help in our community during this time if we are able, helping people who are elderly or vulnerable or um, aren't able to leave the house for whatever reason? What would you recommend doing and how can we support people during this crisis? So there is a fantastic and super inspiring network of mutual COVID-19 mutual aid support groups. And there's one in virtually every area of the UK. It's fantastic. You can join your local group on Facebook or through WhatsApp, and then you will be assigned errands to do for people that need prescriptions picking up, shopping picking up. It doesn't mean you have to stand in the supermarket queue or stand in the prescription queue, but that's a fantastic way of helping right now. And you can just do it when you're available. So join your local mutual aid, COVID-19 mutual aid group. We also have on the Made in Hackney website how to set up a COVID-19 food service. So if you go to our website, there's now a dedicated page with information that you might find useful if you want to set up a meal service like we've done. So there's posters, hygiene posters for the kitchen, protocols for the couriers, a training video for your bicycle couriers. There's, there's all sorts of information on there. So do check that out if you're interested in doing that in your local area. Amazing. And just finally, how can we find you? How, is, how can anyone who is watching this keep up with what you're doing personally as well as Made in Hackney? What would you recommend? So check out our website, madeinhackney.org. You can also find us on Instagram, just at Made in Hackney. But on Facebook, it's not a very catchy address, made underscore, <laughs> it's really long. It's, it's actually it's Made in Hackney Local Food Kitchen on Facebook. Um, the most place we're active is Instagram. Um, we are on Twitter as well, which is made underscore in underscore Hackney. But we're mostly on Instagram these days. But, you know, go to our website. Our contact details are there. Our email is there. We're here if you need to get in touch and ask questions, ask for advice, or even ask how you can help or get involved. We've got loads of recipes on our website. Yeah, I've done um, some, I've tried some of those, like the, the veggie and the lentil meatballs and things, and they're really good. So definitely, I think that they're really good budget recipes for anyone who is kind of kind of twiddling up their thumbs deciding what to cook because I know it's quite difficult when you're cooking breakfast, lunch and dinner right now. A lot of us aren't used to doing that. It's quite different. Yeah, absolutely. We do have some quite jazzy, expensive recipes on our website as well. So some are more budget, some are for sort of foodies with a bit more money to spend. We do have a PDF on our website, a cookery book called Fifty Feasts. Um, so you're very welcome to download that. And that's a PDF booklet, cookery book, where everything is under one pound a portion. So by all means, um, download that and get stuck in there as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to sign off and I just want to thank everyone who's watched this video. I know it was, it was slightly longer than our other webinars, but we had three such amazing dishes to learn from Sarah. And um, four, if you four. Point, oh, four, four dishes, sorry, <laughs> four dishes. I'm definitely going to be recreating them myself, I think, next week. And um, if you enjoyed this video, then definitely stay tuned because we're having a webinar every two weeks. We're going to be joined by lots of amazing health professionals discussing everything everything from mental health to lifestyle medicine to cancer to lots of other topics and especially of course you know keeping everyone updated on what's happening with COVID-19 and the situation. So check us out at plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com. Definitely join us as a member if you're able to and join this incredible community. Good night. Thank you. Bye.